What if you went to a revival, saw a mighty move of God, and then 50 years later returned to see it all happen again? Sounds interesting, does it? Don't go away. Revival Radio TV is next. Welcome back again to Revival Radio TV. I'm Gene Bailey. Listen, for over seven years, we've been doing this program at this time. And listen, I'm excited about what we get to see. We talk about things that happen, you know, from the Celtic Christians to what's going on today. Well, today you're going to hear a great testimony and hear the story of Alan Mather. Alan, welcome to the program. Thanks for being here. Alan, all right, let's get started. Before we dive into the revival that you were a part of, Give some people your personal background. How did you come to know the Lord, et cetera? Well, that was an interesting story because uh, I was an atheist and um, I met my wife in a parking lot and it's kind of a weird situation. She actually put a note in my car and it's kind of weird. And then she went home and told her dad and her dad was, well, you know, if he calls you, let him come talk to me, you know. So uh, I called her. We talked for five hours. And then I went to her house and her dad, when I walked in the door, her dad recognized me. He had dreamed of me two years before. And he went to the back room and he told her mom, he said, that's the guy she'll marry. That's the guy that I dreamed about. And he didn't say a whole lot to me. Here, his awesome Christian daughter was dating an atheist. He didn't care because he saw me in a dream. He started to pray and intercede for me. And I started feeling the Holy Spirit and it started freaking me out. I started (laughs) feeling this feeling come over me that I said, okay, is this an emotion? No, it's not an emotion because I've never felt it before. And it started leading me to Jesus. And then I started going to a little church that... uh, that they went to and uh, I went, I gave an altar call and I went to the altar. The pastor said, well, we'll just invite Jesus into your heart. And I invited him in and he actually came in. I actually felt him come in and it freaked me out. Yeah. And, uh, and then when I went to the altar, I'd never prayed before in my life. He said, invite Jesus to come into your heart. And I started to pray and could not stop. I, I don't know what the people, the people are probably hungry and wanting to go home. Here's this kid, you know, I was uh, 20, 21 at this altar, just, no, 19, I think it was, and just praying his heart out. And it was like Jesus came in, the Holy Spirit came in, and whoa, that rocked my world. You decided to go to school. Where'd you go to school? Well, uh, I went to University of Kentucky to study architecture. Architecture was my dream. Right. My dream job. I, I kind of had a negative self-image growing up, so I had to do something great. So my goal was to be the world's greatest architect. Yeah. And in about two years, I started getting kind of unsettled about it, uh, if this was what God wanted me to do. And so I had this um, dream, and in the dream, uh, it was like, where will you be in 10,000 years? And where will your buildings be in 10,000 years? And so it was like, whoa, 10,000 years. I need to start looking at a 10,000 year perspective. And then I saw a ball and crane knocking down all the buildings that I had built because they were out of date. And I was like, I want to do something in the eternal realm. Mm. And so I decided to, to leave my architectural career. And everybody was freaking out. They're like, God needs architects. I said, no, there's something greater that God has for me. And I'm going to pursue it. And I don't know exactly what it is, but I'm going in the direction of eternal things. So that's good. So then you decided to go to a different school. And so what did you do there? So I transferred to Asbury 
University right. because the pastor of the church I was going to, he graduated from there and he recommended it. And, and it was just 20 minutes from where University of Kentucky was. So I just transferred to Asbury. And, and I didn't quite know what I was gonna do, but I was heading toward something, pastor or something. But you just knew you were supposed to be there. Yeah. All right, so revival scholars scoring at home. You know which school we're talking about, Asbury. Uh, it was just Asbury College. Yeah, at that time. It was Asbury University as it is now. Uh, so let's talk about what really happened there in 1970. Kind of walk us through it, because you were there at that revival at Asbury that we've, it's been in the news a lot recently and everything that has happened recently at Asbury too. So walk us through what was going on uh, with you and with the school leading up to that. Okay, and that's in 1970. Right. Okay. Uh, 1970 was, you know, the, the hippie movement, the Vietnam War protests. Right, right. Burning of buildings. In fact, at University of Kentucky, they burned down the ROTC building. Uh, so it was a very, uh, in, in Asbury, you know, there was a lot of uh, turmoil there. They had four presidents at one time. And everybody was fighting who wanted to be, you know, who, who they wanted to be the president. So there was a lot of turmoil that, that went on in the college. There were students going out on the weekends, getting drunk and selling drugs. And Christian college, you know, these kids, and they, chapel was boring, you know. Spiritual things were boring to probably half the student body, maybe. Right. The rest just kind of hung in there. But then uh, on February the 3rd, uh, 1970, um, God came. So talk, walk us through that day. Okay. It was a, it was a, a chapel service. We had chapel three times a week, uh, Tuesday and Saturday and Thursday we had chapel. So, so the whole student body met. And it was... Uh, the dean was supposed to speak that day, and he decided not, not to speak. He was just going to open it up for testimonies. And so what happened was um, some students just stood up from their seat. One guy, was, he, was, he was real popular, and he, uh, he said, uh, he said, I've, I've been faking it. I, I wasn't a Christian. I've been doing all kinds of stuff. He said, but God has met me. God is changing my heart. And, and another student stood up and, and, and similar thing. You know, I've been, I've been a faker. I haven't been real. And it was like the presence of God just came in to that auditorium. I could feel it. It was like, well, what is this? And then other students started getting up and sharing. And then they just gave an altar call to come forward and... Um, I don't know, a third of the student body came forward crying and, you know, praying out loud. And it was, I was like, okay, this is a revival. So you were, you were feeling something really happening in the room. Now, it's interesting to me, most, uh, most of you watching, a lot of preachers, uh, would, pastors would say, well, we're going to, praise and worship and, and go down this path and then the Holy Spirit will come. But what you're telling me is what happened is somebody stood up and telling the truth about how they weren't living the lie. Yeah. So it was kind of a testimony in reverse, but he was being really honest yeah. Yeah. Uh, about what was going on. And that's where, it, when, he, when he was stood up to tell, you know, basically confess where he was at, is that when you felt things, the atmosphere change in the room? But I think it was, it was happening before he stood up. Right. You know, there was, there was this presence that was kind of brooding over the student body at, right. at, at, at before. But, but then as he stood up, and I think that's what prompted him to stand up, was just the presence of God was beginning to get strong. Yeah. And, uh, and it, was, it was amazing. I sat there and it kept getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And then students started getting up and giving their testimonies. Sitting back here thinking, man, if they don't stop these people coming up here, this thing's going to get out of hand. I said, I'm not leaving this place until I find peace of mind, peace in my heart. And I was sitting up there in the balcony, and I thought, 
just let them sing one more verse and I'll go down. And they did. And I had to keep my promise. And I went down and I, I just laid over that altar and I said, Lord, it's either go forward with you or go back. I skipped chapel. Long about 12.30 when, every, when I knew that everybody should be back from chapel, I never heard a sound. And I began to work. I began to worry a little bit. What's going on? What's going on over there? Long about one o'clock, a thought arrived in my mind. The rapture had come, Richard. I'm thankful that this afternoon I know that the Lord has saved me. I didn't think I could really know or be as sure as I feel right now. And I thank the Lord because it's only Him by the end of that day I knew that something very powerful was happening we walked up the steps to Hughes Auditorium uh, to go in and it just hit you like a wind it was just like whoa and, and students would sit in that chapel for hours students who, did, who thought chapel was boring now were sitting there for you know, 24, 36 hours. Um, it went on for 24 hours a day, seven days for 185 hours straight. There, there, there was something, you know, was going on in worship and people would get up and, and share a song or share a testimony or, but it was just, there was something, I can't even describe it, you know, today, but there was something I mean, it's the presence of God. Right. And, and the first thing we're to pray for uh, is in the Lord's Prayer is thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's our very first pri- prayer priority. And it's almost like what was the glory and the power of God in heaven came down and descended on us. It was like a, a, a porthole or a, you know, they say in, science fiction kind of wormholes where you yeah. go from one dimension to the other. It was like another dimension, the dimension of God descended on us. You told me about some intercessory prayer that was going on. Yes. Tell that story. Yeah, yeah, because the revival didn't come just because somebody gave a testimony. Right. Uh, there was a lot of preparation. There was one, one girl, bless her heart, uh, <clears throat> Janine Braben, When she got to Asbury, she felt like she was to intercede for the school. A lot of bad stuff were happening. She went to the the president of the college and she goes, you know, kids are sneaking out on the weekend and doing bad stuff, but don't worry, God's gonna come. And uh, she kind of settled him down. It's like, everything's gonna be okay. And she started praying 20, she said 24 seven. She, she got every student's name, went to the registry office, got every student's name, put it on a three by five card and all day long would pray for each student at the college. She said, I would pray up into the night. She said, I would even almost feel like I was praying in my sleep. She said, God said, your job while you're here is to intercede for this school. And just a little. Now, did anybody know about that? Not really. This came out later. But, uh, you know, you think of a little shy college student, her parents were missionaries in South America, Hmm. getting a, what would you call it, just a a mandate from God to intercede. I mean, it's astounding. You know, a young student, take on that burden. Uh, And so as the school year went along, she uh, started to... uh, kind of organized some prayer things. They, they had an all-night prayer meeting in Hughes Auditorium in October, and uh, 150 students came, and it was powerful. Uh, it lasted until 3 in the morning, wow. and then one of the professors uh, um, said, well, do you all think you got what you came for? And they were like, yeah. And so they, they, they lined all the way around Hughes Auditorium, 3 in the morning, and just thanked God for coming and bringing revival, praying for revival. And then she got some prayer meetings organized before chapel. Uh, There's a basement in Hughes, 
and they would go down and, you know, seven or eight students would pray because she, she realized that, you know, that, that prayer was going to bring revival. What happened after that? What, how did this keep going in your life? Well, um, all I can say is it was like, I mean, this was, I mean, it, it, it's almost hard to even describe in English what I felt and what we all felt. It was this presence of God so heavy and so strong. And one of the things that happened was it wasn't like the, the, the revival, you know, a few weeks ago uh, because there wasn't social media. Right. So we traveled out to churches and universities. I tell you, this thing is it's unbelievable. It's snowballed, and look at it spreading out all over the place. I tell you, when this thing first started, I couldn't have believed it wouldn't have got beyond here for a couple hours, but now it's going all over the place. It's in California, New York, it's down in Florida. I found out it's going down to my hometown now. Praise the Lord. The Asbury Spontaneous Revival may turn into a nationwide revival in colleges and universities. Two Asbury students spoke at other colleges, one in California, one in Illinois today, and chapel both as Azusa Pacific College near Los Angeles where Asbury student Wayne Anthony spoke this morning is still going as we took the air. The same at Greenville, Illinois College, where Mark Davis spoke today. The Asbury story may be mushrooming into something big throughout the nation. For, I first went to my home church uh, in Lexington, and my wife and I and a couple others shared just simple testimonies, you know. Yeah. But my wife and I, when we walked up to the platform, we looked at each other, and, at each other and said, they have no idea what's gonna happen this morning. We felt like a bomb was gonna go off. Yeah, sure. And we just shared a simple testimony of what God did. We gave an altar call, and I mean, people started running, crying wow. to the altar. And we were looking at this altar of all these people just crying their eyes out. And it was, but there was something that, that was on us. Yeah. And it was on us for about six months. God, because the revival lasted 185 hours, but it went on the rest of the school year with teams going out every weekend. At least half the student body was going somewhere. And we went to Westfield, Indiana, and we were so just filled with the presence of God, we couldn't even eat. And, and they had this buffet for us, and the only thing we could eat was radishes. <laughs> so we just wow. sat and ate radishes, you know. And we shared in high schools and different places. And everywhere we went, this presence of God was with us. The same presence that was at Asbury was with us where we went. And it was just, it, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was hard for us to uh, comprehend. We, we couldn't quite get our hand around it. But we knew something very unusual had happened that will mark us. There was a lady that came to the revival, and got up and shared, and she said, you guys have been ruined. We're like, what do you mean ruined? She goes, because once you've seen God move, you're never satisfied with Amen. men's efforts again. Amen to that. That's what happened to us, was we got ruined, you know, to men's efforts. Mm -hmm. We wanted to see God move. And it was, it was crazy. So we, we just went all kinds of places. And then when I graduated, I was like, I'm, I'm going back to the University of Kentucky, not as a student. Right. And I'm going to start a revival. The same thing, that happened, if it can happen in Asbury, it can happen at the University of Kentucky. Sure. So uh, I kind of got into the Jesus movement at that point. Right. And, um, and it, it was just, it, I was like, shot out of a spiritual cannon. <laughs> and I would spend eight, 10 hours a day witnessing to college students. I'm, I would make tracks. We'd hold concerts um, with a thousand kids would show up. It was just, it was like the Jesus movement and the Asbury revival morphed together at that point for me. You know, I kind of grew my hair out long and kind of became, you know, a Jesus freak, yeah. you know, which was cool because, you know, you know, I didn't have on a, with a big Bible and a black suit. Sure. You know, I fit into this culture and, and, and they weren't defensive because I, I kind of looked like a, a hippie. And, so, yeah. and hippies were called freaks. And so hippies that were into Jesus were called Jesus freaks. That's right. So, yeah. So let's, uh, 
Okay, first off, with the Asbury revival, I don't want to leave that too far in the... Yeah. But did you stay in contact with uh, the people at school as you, as you guys left and went all your different ways? Um, everybody kind of graduated, and we all kind of went our separate ways. But last week in Tulsa, I got to hook up with a guy named Tim Philpott. We were in the revival together, and I hadn't seen him in 50 wow. years. And we just had, we had the, the best time together. We, we, we kind of did a meeting together about it. And, uh, and it was funny because uh, he, a friend of mine who knows him, he said, you all speak the same language. Yeah. He said, he said when you talk about the revival and when you talk about the move of God, you all both use exactly the same term. So there was something that got on us then that never left. It never left me. Uh, my wife and I have lived the craziest life. We've, you know, I started, you know, I got involved in the Jesus movement and one, we lived in a trailer and one, one summer we had 15 hippies living with us. I don't know whether you saw the movie. Oh, yeah. You know, we were poking each other, you know, like, yeah, that was us, hippies moving in, you know. Uh, but it's just a, a fabulous time. And I'd still keep up with some of those people that came to the Lord during that time, during that time uh, uh, you know, are still friends of mine. And so, you know, we just kind of, we've always worked with youth. For some reason, that revival uh, put in my heart youth. And I've always worked with college age and high school age. And right before COVID, I was uh, working in high schools. And it was, it was wonderful. That same presence that same drive that got on Lifting. me 50 years later, wow. it, it's, it, it hasn't left. But it was just, you know, it's just the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And, you know, reading through the book of Acts, yeah. the book of Acts is more the Acts of the Holy Spirit than it is the Acts of the Apostles. And, and, and so, you know, what, that's, you know, that's what changed me was, was the presence of God. Talking about, Asbury, and, and I can feel the people that are watching saying, yeah. that sounds so good. So I, is there any way for me to have that now? Now, at other college students have come up to me and says, what do we do to get that here? Yeah. <laughs> How do you respond to those questions? Okay, uh, I go back to uh, Janine Braben, <clears throat> intercessory prayer, but not just, you know, praying prayers. This is getting, getting really close to God, mm. you know, going to the throne room of God, talking to him on a deep level. How do you do that? Tell the people, how do you do that? I just go there. <laughs> I know I'm invited. You know, the veil has been torn in two. We are invited into the Holy of Holies. Um, and I just go there, uh, sometimes just in my mind. Sure. Like last night, you know, I was thinking about this interview and I was like, okay, I'm just gonna go hang out in the Holy of Holies in heaven with Jesus, right. you know? And I was laying in bed and had my blanket over me and just kind of imagine I'm, I'm, I'm there with Jesus, with my blanket, laying down, and he's so happy that I'm there. He's right. so glad that, I, that I've come to talk with him. So I, I really think revival comes through uh, intimacy with God. I know we use that term a lot, but yeah. getting close to him, talking real. Not sure. hand prayers or, or prayer, but just getting down real, real what's going on in your life and talking to God about it. And then the Lord's Prayer. I think that's the key. Right. Because, you know, Jesus would go off and pray for hours, you know, and it mystified the disciples. What, you know, right when the crowds came, he would go into the mountains and pray and be with his father. And, and they and like, right when his ministry was ready to take off, he's up there on the mountain talking to the Father. Teach us to pray. Yeah. And the first thing was, thy kingdom come on earth just as it is in heaven. So that's our first prayer priority. God, your presence that is in heaven, would you come to earth? Would you bring the Holy Spirit? to our family, to me personally. Right. You know, what? you don't have to be in a college setting or a, set, a church setting 
This is an individual thing. Revival is an individual thing. And when we ask the Holy Spirit to come, and I get spiritually dry a lot. You know, I don't know whether you do, but I do. Oh, sure. <laughs> and do. and um, when I get spiritually dry, I start asking the Holy Spirit to come. I, I can feel I'm, I'm drifting and, and, and I'm dependent on the Holy Spirit. I say, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. And you, always within three days, I can feel his presence come. Mm. So you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more does your heavenly father want to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? You can't clean your life up enough. You can't get, do this enough. You can't give enough money enough. Asking is the way forward. Because of the blood of Jesus, now we, do, we ask. And God will come, but there's a persistence that comes because right after the Lord's Prayer, the thing Next, the next thing was the friend at midnight where he knocks and he knocks. So as we wrap this one up, I, I want you to just look to the camera and pray for those people that are going, man, I want that. You're really, you're really uh, hitting them where, they're, where they live. So just pray for them. Okay. <clears throat> Father, we just thank you that we have complete access to you. We thank you that we can go into the Holy of Holies and make our requests made known to you. I pray for these people who are listening, who have children that have strayed or uh, are in difficult situations. Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray, oh God. Teach us to pray, because it's in praying that you come. It's in asking that you come. It's in loving you that you come. So I just ask you, Lord God, to start a revival in these people's lives who are listening, that are needing your presence. We ask you to move mightily across this nation. We so desperately need you right now. Yes. We are desperate, desperate people, but you love desperation because you love us to be with you. So God, we just ask you to come upon these people who are listening right now, Holy Spirit, come. Woo them, teach them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you've prayed that with Alan and you need someone else to pray with you and you want to testify, maybe you want to confess something, there's a prayer line right there that you can call, 877-281-6297. There's a licensed prayer ministry on the other end of that phone that's ready to pray with you. Alan, thank you for being on the program. We're going to pick this up next week, part two, because you went back to Asbury. You don't want to miss a minute of that one. We'll see you next time. Till then, God bless you.